All right, so this is the first of four lectures for the histology of the male reproductive system. And in this lecture, we're going to be covering the histology and the relevant physiology of the testes. So just an overview of the male reproductive system. It consists of the male gonads, the testes, a series of ducts, the accessory glands, and then the penis. The primary function consists of producing sperm and then male rep reproductive hormones. The primary one of that is testosterone which mediates male reproductive health and, and development of male features during both embryonic development and then puberty as well. In the male reproductive organs, as we've talked about a little bit before, they sit in the pelvis. For example, like here's the prostate, as we talked about previously. We talked about the urinary system. It sits just below the bladder in the male. Here in the scrotum, you have the testes, and then you have the penis here with the male urethra traveling through it. So the anatomy of the testes, so during development, they initially form in the abdomen, retroperitoneally, and then they actually descend into their permanent location down in the scrotum. So they actually travel quite a distance during development, and then they're suspended in a pouch of skin called the scrotum, which is, as you can see here, and this positions the testes just close enough to the body core for the ideal temperature for spermatogenesis to occur, which is about 2 to 4 degrees Celsius below body temperature which if you recall is about 37 degrees Celsius. There's spermatic cords, which are essentially these cords that suspend the testicles, so like this. They, they carry the neurovascular supply and the vas deferens, so they carry the artery, the vein, the nerves, and then they carry the vas deferens as well, which is a long tube that carries spermatozoa from the testes to the urethra. So it essentially gets it from where they're produced in the testes down into the urethra for reproduction. And so if you look here, the vas deferens comes you know, out of the scrotum and up through into the abdomen or into the pelvis here, and then it travels over the bladder like this and then actually connects to the ejaculatory duct which collects secretions from other male reproductive glands and then empties into the urethra. There's the cremaster muscle, which is attaches to the spermatic cord, and this actually contracts to pull the testes closer to the body. And the same thing is, is for temperature control as well. It will contract to pull the testicles closer to the body to, again, achieve that ideal temperature for spermatogenesis to occur. So the testes, they're enclosed in a two-layer thick connective tissue covering. The first of those layers is the tunica albuginea. This is the most inner layer, and you can see this here in this diagram, as you can see. Then outside of that, you have the tunica vaginalis. So the tunica albuginea is a very fibrous, dense layer, and it consists of dense, irregular connective tissue, and it encloses the testes and then extends into the parenchyma of the testes, actually, to divide it up into lobules, and you can appreciate that here. So here's the tunica albuginea, and you can see these septa extending into the parenchyma to divide it up, and we'll talk more about that in a second. Then outside of the tunica albuginea, you have the tunica vaginalis, which is a two-layer serous membrane, and it consists of a parietal and a visceral layer, and this is outside, and you can see it's represented by this dotted line here. The parietal layer of the tunica vaginalis contains a muscle called the dartos muscle. This is a muscle that will contract when the scrotum is exposed to cold temperatures, and it gives the scrotum kind of a wrinkled appearance on the outside. And this could be an example of, say, a male walks into a swimming pool or a pond or a lake with very cold water. That would cause it to contract in response to the cold temperature. And again, the same thing there is to help with ideal temperature control. Here's a great section of the tunica albuginea, and you can really appreciate that it's the thick, dense, irregular connective tissue. So you see it's very densely packed together, very fibrous, significant collagen component here. And then as you can see, there's no uniform direction like you would see in dense, regular connective tissue. And as you can see, it, it lies outside of, these would be what's called the seminiferous tubules, and we'll talk a lot about these in a second. This is more of the parenchyma, the functional tissue of the testes. As you can see, it encloses it to provide significant protection. So as far as the blood supply to the testes, the arterial supply is carried by the testicular artery. The venous drainage is via the testicular veins. There's also a second vein called the pempiniform plexus. And this, you can see, this is a great picture of it. It's almost like a web or a net-like structure, a network of veins that that's wraps around the testicular artery. You can see the testicular artery here in red. And then you can see, appreciate the blue pempiniform plexus wrapping around it. And this more serves to regulate the temperature of the blood that's actually flowing directly into the testes and the testicular artery. It sure, it helps with draining the blood, but again, that's not the main function. The main function is actually cool the blood. Because remember, the ideal temperature for spermatogenesis is about two to four degrees below your core body temperature. So you wanna cool the blood just a little bit as it goes into the testes to give you that ideal temperature.
The tunica albuginea, it thickens posteriorly to form what's called the mediastinum testes. And then from this thickened portion, you have septa that extend into the testes, like we were talking about earlier, to divide it into hundreds of lobules that contain seminiferous tubules, which are the site of spermatogenesis. And so you can see that here. Here's all these septa like this. And then between them, you see these seminiferous tubules, which are these very coiled tubes where spermatogenesis occurs. And we'll talk a lot about those in a second here. And so it's essentially, it's again, dividing the testes up into functional units. So the seminiferous tubules, as we pointed out previously, they're these lengthy coiled tubes that are condensed within the testes. They're essentially packed into these different lobules, separated by these septa extending from the tunica albuginea. And so you can see them in here. And so these tubes, they're lined by a seminiferous germinal epithelium, and this is what's responsible for producing spermatozoa, or the process known as spermatogenesis. Each tubule is surrounded by an underlying basal lamina, and then a collagen-rich extracellular matrix synthesized by these special cells called paratubular myoid cells, and we'll show you a section of these in a second. The other thing that happens in the testes is testosterone production, but I want to make this very clear. It's produced by a separate type of cells called the Leydig cells, and these are cells that are found within the connective tissue between the seminiferous tubules. So the seminiferous tubules is not the site of testosterone production. Leydig cells are. So again, here's a nice histological section of seminiferous tubules. Now remember, this is very coiled, so it's going to be, you know, wrapping around like this, and you're essentially, you know, cutting a cross section through it. So that's why you see the cross section of all these different tubules like this. You see, you know, all of these are seminiferous tubules, and then here this clear white section, and here these are the lumens for all these different tubes. And so what's encircling these lumens is a germinal epithelium, and this is where newly produced spermatozoa are produced, and then they're released into that lumen. There's two types of cells that, are, that kind of make up that germinal epithelium. One is the Sertoli cells, and then the other are the cells that are actually undergoing spermatogenesis. And so actually, if you see in the arrow here, these are Sertoli cells that are lining the epithelium. And the thing about the Sertoli cells is, again, it all in histology, it always depends on the cut. You don't always see everything in full. But in a theoretical section, what you would see is so you'd have the lumen like this. You'd have a basal lamina out like this, encircling the entire tubule like we talked about. And then you'd have, you know, just like any other epithelial lumen lined by cells, and these would be your Sertoli cells. So your Sertoli cells actually are completely in sequence all the way around the lumen, and they encircle this lumen where this, the sperm are released. And then they, these are actually, as we'll talk about, all bound by tight junctions to give you what's known as the blood testes barrier. And we'll talk more about that in a few slides. But again, what I'm trying to drive home is, is that this entire epithelial lumen is lined by Sertoli cells in sequence. And the reason I make such a big deal out of that is you don't always appreciate that because you can see here's a Sertoli cell, here's a Sertoli cell again and again here. And then you can see where it doesn't always come in continuous here in this section. And again, that just, it's, it's the way the tissue's cut. You don't always see it perfectly. And then the thing is between these Sertoli cells are the cells that are actually undergoing spermatogenesis. And so, like I've said, these Sertoli cells, they're columnar to pyramidal shaped. They're non-dividing epithelial cells. And then they have these dendritic extensions of cytoplasm that extend the width of the wall of the seminiferous tubule. So if you look at a true Sertoli cell, if you look at like on an electron microscopy image, what you'd see is, is kind of these extensions out like this. And what that allows them to do, and you'll see it on you know, both sides like this, it allows them to kind of interdigitate between the cells that are undergoing spermatogenesis. And the reasoning for that is that it's to help it carry out its actual function, which is to provide both physical and then metabolic support for these cells undergoing spermatogenesis. And they do that by secreting fructose, ions, proteins. They also carry out phagocytosis of cellular debris that's shed by these germ cells during spermatogenesis. So again, sure they line the lumen, but they also are very supportive of the spermatogenesis process. Here's a great view of a myoid cell. So you can see it here, indicated by the black arrow. And you can see they're really found on the outside portion, the outer portion of the seminiferous tubule. They line the basement membrane. And then their contractile ability, again, helps to create these weak peristalsis-type contractions to help propel sperm throughout the seminiferous tubules.
So as I mentioned previously, Sertoli cells are bound by occluding junctions, and specifically these occluding junctions are between the basolateral cell membranes of the Sertoli cells, and this helps form the blood testes barrier. Now what that does is it can creates two compartments, the adluminal compartment and the basal compartment. And we'll show you kind of in a simple diagram, we have a much better diagram on the next slide that'll show you this, but. So this is one Sertoli cell, and then here's another one. And again, here would be your basal lamina down here. This would be the lumen here. So it creates two compartments. You have the basal compartment, which makes sense. It's down by the basal lamina. And then you have the adluminal compartment. which is where spermatogenesis is actually occurring. And so what this does is it helps spermatogenesis to occur in an isolated and protected environment. Because down here, as we'll show on the next diagram, on the next slide, we have the spermatogonia down here, which are essentially the germ cells or stem cells that then will differentiate into cells that are carrying out the process of spermatogenesis. And so it not only provides a physical barrier, but it also decreases the entry of antibodies and leukocytes, which would prevent an immune response to spermatogenic cells. The reason that's important is because you don't want the immune system to recognize cells undergoing spermatogenesis in the final sperm as foreign cells or foreign antigens and then to form an attack and kill them. That would kill the reproductive potential of the individual. And so by preventing the immune system from being able to just freely enter in here, that helps again pro provide further protection for the developing sperm. So again, here's a diagram here, and we'll go through these different types, you know, the spermatocytes, spermatid, all these, when we go over spermatogenesis in the next lecture. But what you need to know here is that, again, here's the basal lamina, here's the Sertoli cells, the lumen would be out here. And then you have the tight junction that's forming here, and then you have these spermatogonia, which again are the male germ cells. They're also stem cells. So this is where sperm will come from, and they'll eventually differentiate into what would be here first order spermatocytes or primary spermatocytes, and then they make their way through spermatogenesis to eventually develop mature spermatid, which then eventually release into the lumen to form sperm. Now, as far as the, these tight junctions, they also form, again, the basal compartment. And then you have the adluminal compartment. And so again, the adluminal compartment is where spermatogenesis is occurring. So just a few other functional facts about the Sertoli cells. So during embryonic development, they secrete what's called malarian inhibiting factor, which inhibits the paramesonephric ducts or the malarian ducts from differentiating into female reproductive organs. Sertoli cells are stimulated by follicle stimulating hormone or FSH. One way you can remember that is S in the FSH and then S in Sertoli cells. And one thing that this causes is an increased secretion of androgen binding protein, also known as ABP. ABP acts in the seminiferous tubules and the epididymis to efficiently concentrate testosterone. And the reasoning for that is that testosterone, among many, its many other functions, helps the maturation process of sperm. After puberty, Sertoli cells secrete activin and inhibin, which regulate FSH secretion from the anterior pituitary. Inhibin provides negative feedback inhibition to GnRH release from the hypothalamus, which goes on to stimulate FSH secretion from the anterior pituitary. So it inhibits this as well as FSH secretion itself from the anterior pituitary. Activin, on the other hand, provides positive feedback to FSH secretion from the anterior pituitary. We'll talk more about inhibin and activin at the end of the lecture. We tie together a number of these endocrine regulatory concepts that we've talked about throughout this lecture. And then the histological appearance of Sertoli cells. They have large, pale euchromatic nucleus with a prominent nucleolus. So you can see here with this arrow, here's the nucleus right here. So remember, this is just the nucleus. And you can see it's very pale, it's euchromatic. Then you have this very prominent nucleolus. And remember, this is just the nucleus. It's not the whole cell. The boundaries of the cytoplasm are actually kind of difficult to differentiate. And so again, you want to use the nucleus to help you identify the cell. But just remember that there's this pale cytoplasm around it, but it's difficult to see where those exact boundaries are. 
So light egg cells, they're also known as interstitial cells because they're found within the vascularized stroma of the testes between the seminiferous tubules. So here, if we look at a section here, this would be a seminiferous tubule here. This would be a seminiferous tubule here, here as well. And then in here, you can see the connective tissue between them. And so again, just to reiterate the fact that light egg cells are the site of production for testosterone, and they're found in between the seminiferous tubules, not within the seminiferous tubules. Testosterone is a steroid hormone, it has a number of functions. It stimulates the development of spermatozoa. It stimulates secretions from the seminal vesicle and the prostate gland. It stimulates the development of male characteristics, the development of male sex organs. And in many target tissues, testosterone is converted into dihydrotestosterone, or DHT, by an enzyme called 5-alpha reductase. Testosterone production is stimulated by luteinizing hormone, or LH for short, and one way you can remember that is LH here, and then the L in light egg cells, and LH is secreted from the anterior pituitary. So testosterone actually provides feedback inhibition to LH release from the anterior pituitary and then GnRH release from the hypothalamus. And then prolactin, which is also secreted by the anterior pituitary, it stimulates increased density of LH receptors on light egg cells. So prolactin actually helps further potentiate the effect of LH on light egg cells. The histological appearance of light egg cells, so they have an eosinophilic granular cytoplasm. You can really appreciate that here. You can see that here's another one here. These ones here as well. They have a round nuclei, as you can see here, and then they have protein crystals of Ranke. So here I just want to provide a very brief summary. You know, your endocrine physiology textbook will go into much more detail than this, but just to kind of tie together some of the points I've made throughout this lecture. So again, you have the hypothalamus up in the brain. And you have the anterior pituitary. And then you have the Sertoli cells. And then you have the Leydig cells. So you have the hypothalamus that releases GnRH, or gonadotropin releasing hormone, which stimulates from the anterior pituitary release of. FSH and LH. So FSH, S for Sertoli cells, and then L for Leydig cells. That's a great way to remember it. So FSH is going to come down and stimulate Sertoli cells, which again carry out spermatogenesis. And then LH will come down and stimulate Leydig cells to produce testosterone. And remember, Sertoli cells support spermatogenesis. And remember, one of those is by secreting androgen-binding protein, ABP, which helps concentrate testosterone within the seminiferous tubules to, again, further the maturation of sperm. Then remember, the anterior pituitary also releases prolactin, which comes down and stimulates increased density of LH receptors. And then for negative feedback, if you recall, Sertoli cells will secrete inhibin to help provide negative feedback to the anterior pituitary to prevent release of further FSH and to the hypothalamus to prevent further release of GnRH. And then testosterone actually comes back in negative feedbacks on the anterior pituitary and on hypothalamus. So this is actually interesting. So if someone is actually taking steroids, like anabolic steroids, such as testosterone, like bodybuilders, weightlifters, athletes, and they're taking it for performance enhancement and, and to increase muscle mass, by giving exogenous testosterone, which is testosterone that is not made within the body, what that actually does is it actually provides negative feedback or an inhibitory effect on the hypothalamus and anterior pituitary. So by those individuals taking exogenous testosterone, they actually decrease production of testosterone within their own body. So their actual, although they are giving themselves testosterone, their body is not producing very much testosterone at all, which is kind of interesting. And so actually, if you were to measure LH level in somebody who is giving themselves exogenous testosterone, the LH level is actually going to be decreased, not increased. 
and it all ties back to the fact that testosterone provides that negative feedback. And again, this is just a brief summary. There's a little bit more to the story here, but this is just to kind of tie together in one simple picture all the different endocrine concepts I talked about in this lecture. All right, so that closes out our discussion of the testes. In the next lecture, we'll talk about spermatogenesis.